Thursday at World Travel Market. My name is Micaela Juarez. I am Head of Communications for the event. For the past years, World Travel Market has made the Thursday of the event the Business Continent Day, where we have brought in senior business leaders and entrepreneurs to the event to give the industry valuable business advice and expertise. Speakers in the past have included former Director General of the Confederation of British Industry, Digby Jones, and Dragon's Den star, Hilary DeBay. Today will be no exception, as we have three great, interesting, and informative sessions lined up for you, covering the topics of city tourism, aviation, and sports tourism. We will start with Deputy Mayor of London for Business Enterprise, Kit Moldhouse. Kit has also been appointed Chair of London and Partners, so in task with securing London's tourism legacy, which he will tell us all his plans for. I will, somewhat cheekily, take this opportunity to publicly inform Kit, and all of you for that matter, the value of World Travel Market to London. WTM generates a massive £160 million each year for the London economy. With the money, our almost 50,000 delegates, including all of you, spend on hotels, restaurants, and other discretionary spend during their time in the city for World Travel Market. This is even more impressive when compared to London Fashion Week, which generates only 100 million pounds from the capitals for the capital's economy. Following Kit, we move on to somebody else who is synonymous with the city of London, Barbara Cassani. Barbara launched No Frills Pioneer Go Fly before being chair and vice chair of London's successful 2012 Olympic bid and delivery team. Barbara will be interviewed by WTM aviation expert John Strickland before joining John and other guests for a panel debate on innovation within the industry. Without further ado, I shall give the floor to Kit to start what I'm sure will be a highly entertaining and thought-provoking programme. Thank you, Kit. It says 45 minutes on there. I think there was some confusion. I said 425 minutes, but there we are. Um, I'll do my best. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to TripAdvisor Best City 2012, and not just because me and my team were on there with our aliases uh, giving us five stars or whatever it is. Um, you're very welcome. I thought what I'd do this morning is talk a little bit about what we're trying to do uh, to stimulate the London economy um, in a wider sense, and then focus in a bit more on the travel and tourism aspect, which, as uh, Michaela said, is incredibly important to us and an area of growing business uh, for a city which has done so well out of tourism uh, in the past. Just to give you a bit of background, um, it won't come as any surprise to you to know that uh, political parties do a lot of polling during election campaigns. And in the mayor's first election campaign um, back in 2008, when we did our polling, the main issue that came out, the number one issue of concern to people in London was crime. Um, at the time, we had a rising number of uh, teenagers being killed, sadly, uh, stabbed most of them. We had some gang crime issues, all the rest of it. And so we focused very much on, on crime in our first term. We halved the number of killings, murder down to a 40-year low. Crime fell just over 11%. Um, it was a fantastic period um, for us. Um, but the true test of it was when we came to the re-election campaign in 2012 and we ran our polling again, uh, crime had dropped um, from the number one slot. That was our, I guess, our political achievement, if you like. But it had been overtaken. It dropped down to number three. It had been overtaken in number one uh, by the economy, uh, by business, the economy, people's anxiety about their jobs. Remember, this is in the aftermath of the, great, uh, of the great crash. And so we decided during the campaign that we needed a political response to this. And so we created, Boris created this position of deputy mayor for business and enterprise and asked me to uh, take on the job. Now, uh, just a bit of context on that. Um, 
London's economy is slightly bigger than the economy of Austria. We are, as, although we're a city, we're basically a medium-sized European nation. Um, uh, population is rising very rapidly. Um, and obviously we have, as well as success as our share of issues. Within that equation, he's given me a team of 25 people and 200 million pounds. Now, if the Minister of the Economy of Austria turned up and said, you know what, I've got a medium-sized European nation, I've got 200 million euros and 25 people, you would think the challenge might be insurmountable. But the truth is, we think we can make a difference by focusing, rather than doing what government often does, which is spread the jam too thin um, so that nobody feels a marginal difference. We're going to focus very much in four particular areas. The first is on infrastructure. Uh, very important uh, uh, for many of your customers that the city works. Um, that the machine works, that the, the wheels turn in a well-oiled fashion. Um, that's not just the transport network where we've seen unprecedented um, investment. You know, we, we currently have the largest uh, civil engineering project in Europe, grind, funnily enough, almost directly under our feet, grinding its way from east and west. Crossrail, which will be a huge new tube line connecting east and west across the city, adding 10% capacity to our network. That will open in 2017 but upgrading all the tube lines, a new bus for London, new iconic bus coming in, but also other infrastructure like superfast broadband. We don't have it in all of the city. We're trying to get it in all of the city. Our waste system is creaking. We've got plans to put a new sewer system in. Water similarly, all our pipes are currently being renewed, which is driving our motorists crazy. There is a massive amount of investment going into infrastructure, and we're doing what we can on that. Uh, the second area is skills. Uh, we don't do much with our hands anymore in this city. Um, uh, we do a lot with this. Uh, we think a lot. We're a city of discovery, of new ideas, of innovation, um, and of the knowledge economy, of services and financial services. But there's a mismatch between our young people and the industries that we, uh, we want to see grow and that are growing in London. And so we're trying to flip the equation around. We have a slightly random system in the UK where students turn up um, after school and say, oh, here's a subject I'm interested in. I'd like to do this course and take a, a bet that there's going to be a job for me at the end of it. Whereas, in fact, if we're going to embed ourselves um, in these particular industries, we need employers to say in the next three, five, ten years, these are the skills we need. Please take these young people and train them now. Let's not have a random system. Let's have more of a predictive system that says, you know, we have the largest growing digital hub in Europe here, just, just down the river in East London. We need more people who can write code. We're short of coders. Why aren't we training young people at a very early age to teach code? For me, code now, well, I've floated this idea with the, the, the Department for Education um, that code should be a modern language, um, that we should shift it in the curriculum to be a modern language. So that instead of forcing us all to speak, well, I learned French, uh, sadly, rustily, um, uh, or maybe Chinese, but code is actually going to be the international language of the future alongside English. Anyway, so skills is one area. The other area is, a third area is an area very close to my heart. I'm unusual in politics in that I, 18 years ago, I qualified as a, well, actually longer than that, 20 years ago, I qualified as a chartered accountant with a firm in the city. But after three years, I realized I was basically unemployable and largely talentless, um, and so that I had to go out and start my own business. It was the only way I was going to make a living in this world. So 18 years ago, I did exactly that, and I still own and, and chair that business. I'm one of the few politicians who can say I've created jobs uh, rather than just talked about it. I've created 10. I'm very proud of that, uh, very proud of that number. Um, but it also means I have to pay 10 mortgages every month and 10 wage bills and uh, 10 of everything and 10 new pensions that the government's making me pay. During those 18 years, I've fought with the tax man, the VAT man, the health and safety guy, the bank manager, my customers. They've all tried to put me out of business um, over those 18 years. And so I feel the pain of small business and, and entrepreneurs on a, on a daily basis. And during those 18 years, it's always irritated me that uh, when politicians talk about business, they always wheel out a FTSE 100 chairman um, and pretend that that's business. Well, it isn't really. It's sort of administration and branding and a bit of accounting. For me, business is hewing your living from the rock on a daily basis with your bare hands, risking your own capital. And those people don't get anywhere near the help they need. Well, that's going to stop in London. So we have a strand particularly focused at small and medium-sized businesses. Um, uh, they employ 51% of, of the working population in London anyway. And if we can grow it very significantly, we'll actually get much more growth there than we will from many of the larger businesses or indeed the public sector in London. So we're looking at access to finance. How do we get more risk capital? 
into small businesses in London, how do we get more entrepreneurs starting up businesses here in the capital, particularly in high growth sectors. We're looking at space. It's very expensive. If you're a growing company, you can find cheap space, you can find smart space when you're huge, but the space in the middle is quite tricky to find. Trade, um, we don't flog enough of our stuff, I'm afraid, in this country. We run a trade deficit in everything other than services. Um, we know that of the companies in London that do export, only 60% started because somebody asked for their product. They didn't think they had something to sell. And so we're leading trade delegations across the world along with our partners UKTI, getting people into that loving feeling about uh, foreign markets, um, uh, teaching them how to sell overseas. We have 40 trade advisors who will sit with small businesses and persuade them, show them, hold their hand in selling their products overseas. And we're having some success. Our, uh, our deficit is falling. And then finally, business support, which is a bit all over the place. In 18 years, I've never had the government come and support me really in any way. Uh, we're going to see if we can do that um, in a more coherent way, although very often the government tends to get in the way. That's the, there used to be the, the great lie in business, I you, some of you may know, it used to be the checks in the post. Well, with the electronic money now, you don't have that anymore. So the, the lie is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. It never really rings true for those people in business, but we're going to try. And then the final area we're going to concentrate on is diversification of our economy. We love financial services in the city. It's fantastic. 63 billion, it contributes to the economy. It pays for everything we do in London and Scotland and Wales as well. But it's a bit monotonous just talking about financial services, and it's a sector that's doing incredibly well. Alongside that, we do have another sector which is of global significance and importance, but we never talk about it, and that's science. Um, we have a huge scientific uh, base here in London. We have um, four of the top 40 universities based here. If you count Oxford and Cambridge, that's six. In one city, that's more than the whole of Japan. Uh, we have two of Europe's, well, number one and number two largest healthcare companies in GSK and AstraZeneca, who are in Cambridge, GSK in the west of London. We have a growing, um, uh, if you like, cluster of startups, both in computer science, in consumer products, in tech city, but also in life sciences along the Euston Road corridor and in various science parks uh, based around London. And we're seeing an incredible period of academic ambition and expansion here in the capital. So Imperial College, the world's leading um, engineering and scientific college, certainly in Europe, is expanding to the west with a three billion new campus out at uh, White City. University College, another top 10 university, is looking to the east, to the Olympic Park. King's College also to the east uh, here in uh, Canary Wharf. It's an incredible base from which we can build and grow some of those businesses which we hope will sustain and, um, and build us into the future. Now all of that work, if you like, came to a head in one incredible uh, six week period or eight week period last year um, in the Olympic Games. Um, it was an incredible platform for me as the London's first deputy mayor for business enterprise to get going. It was a wonderful period. People looked at the city, saw the trains running on time. There were police everywhere. The army were on the streets. It was a fascist heaven for us. We sort of clicked our fingers and things happened. Um, but the truth is it prompted a kind of re-evaluation of London around the world. People looked at a city which they'd bracketed in a certain way and, um, uh, as I say, re-evaluated it. They saw us as friendly, opening, welcome, diverse, efficient, clean. The city looked incredibly smart. Um, you know, we put a lot of work into making sure uh, that it did. But they saw really a city that was happy and thriving. And that seems to have had a, a ripple effect across the globe. And so for me in my role as chairman of London and Partners, alongside my deputy mayor duties, which is our promotional and foreign direct investment agency, we're coming into a kind of purple period. So in terms of investment, we've had a kind of tidal wave of international capital that is crashing over our shores from the Gulf, from China, from Malaysia, uh, from Canada, America. We're seeing pension funds now looking into some of the hard and soft assets in the capital. And it's, uh, it's making our lives incredibly easy. Um, uh, we've always been a big recipient of foreign direct investment, but we seem to be receiving even more now um, than we have in the past. And you only have to look at the cranes in the sky across the skyline of London to see that, that growth. And of course, our economy is outstripping um, the growth, general growth in the UK economy, and our population is growing very rapidly. We're going to put on about a million people um, every 10 years. And within that mix, of course, one of our most important industries is the one that you're all here to talk about, which is um, tourism. 
and there's no doubt about it that, that the, this re-evaluation that took place during the Olympic Games has boosted our tourism performance to an enormous extent. We are the only city, I think, in history where tourism numbers have gone up after the Olympic Games, not down. We're up about 8% overall year on year on tourism numbers, about 12% on value. So 8% more are coming, but they're also spending a hell of a lot more money. And in some particular markets, we're seeing extraordinary growth. So our numbers of tourists coming from China are up about 38, 40% year on year. Uh, they're actually, Chinese tourists are most valuable. They spend the most money when they come. Similarly, uh, related travel, so students, uh, international students, very important for us. They come, they add to our thinking value in our universities. They obviously pay to be there. But the great thing for us is mum and dad will come two or three times a year as well to see them. Um, and so the more students we have, the more mums and dads we get and family and all the rest of it who come and spend money too. And the challenge for us in that growth is how do we sustain it? How do we stay at the top of our game and drive ourselves at the table, not just as a city, but also as a country? So although we have, you know, people see us as a popular tourist destination, we're seventh, I think, globally in terms of visitors. London is slightly higher in the table. And we've got a lot of exciting cities and countries coming up behind us. Istanbul, for instance, growing very strongly. So how do we maintain our leave, grab a, a bigger slice of what is, as China and India open up for travel, going to be a bigger and bigger cake? Well, the truth is the, the, it came to me most vividly during the games. We ran a, London and Partners ran a big uh, hosting program. We had lots of big cheeses from across the world came, billionaires, all sorts of stuff. Funny enough, I sat next to one guy at the opening ceremony, a guy from India. I said I was talking to him about his business. Oh, I started with a couple of tables in a market in Delhi. But, and I've been building it up for the last 20 years. I said, oh, how many people do you employ now? He said, oh, we've just gone through the million. <laughs> I thought, there's a guy called Sabrota Roy, who runs the Sahara Group, who just bought the Grosvenor House on, on Park Lane. Anyway, some incredible people came. But we also had a great British export success, a guy called Johnny Ive, who's the chief designer at Apple. And um, we were talking to him about products. As he said, I, slightly with his tongue in his cheek, I'm not sure if it was, but he said, um, at Apple, they don't think about making money. Uh, they think about making a great product, and they assume that if they make a great product, the money will follow. And so I started to think, well, maybe you know, that is the secret to how we sustain London as a, as a tourist and travel destination, is thinking about our product. Because you, you, know, you, you can promote all you want. If your product isn't great, if your product isn't uh, something that's innovating, constantly changing, then you're likely to attract people more than once, certainly not for repeat, and certainly not in, in increasing volumes. And so we are very much concentrating and looking at, at our product in all its aspects, not just what we've got, but also what's coming. So if you look in particular areas, in culture, for instance, where we have you know, an incredible bedrock of cultural institutions, um, we have been putting new cultural institutions into that product mix over the last 10 or 15 years. So we've had Tate Modern, um, now the, one of the biggest tourist attractions, I think, in Europe, if not the biggest, I think, uh, which is attracting huge numbers of people. We've got the British Museum, has a big extension, it's opening next year, just across the river here. Obviously, the O2 now, the biggest entertainment venue uh, in Europe. And next April, the Olympic Park will open, filled with entertainment and, and sporting venues. And of course, many of our cultural attractions remain completely free. And there will be some exciting new innovative ones. There's been news, I don't know if any of you have seen this plan that we're trying to get going for a garden bridge across the river, which will be a massive, iconic statement for London, designed by Thomas Heatherwick, who did the Olympic Cauldron, you know, a great, uh, great British designer, um, putting a beautiful new uh, uh, bridge across from the South Bank to Temple, which will have a garden on it. It will be a kind of modern interpretation of the Ponte Vecchio. It will be green rather than houses. It will be an incredible attraction. In sport, you know, people saw last year a city which, which loves its sport, even sports we'd never heard of or we don't play in this country, like handball water polo, the first time we've ever had a sellout Paralympics. So we've got a whole program of sporting occasions over the next few years. We've got the Tour de France coming next year. Uh, we've got the Rugby World Cup in uh, 2015, the IAAF World Athletics Championships in 2017. We've got the ATP World Finals just over the river in, uh, at the O2 at the moment. I hope some of you have booked tickets. Sadly, Andy Murray's injured, but if you feel like going, so I'm sure there's some tickets uh, going. And there will be a whole range of other, uh, that, that sport, sorry, comes off the back of our existing sporting heritage, Premier League, Wimbledon, you know, the uh, Six Nations at Twickenham, all those kind of things that we have, creates a massive pole, if you like, the sporting capital of Europe, really. There'll be more sport in 
London than there will be in any other city around the world. And then you get into what I call animation. How do we animate the city? What is, is it that's constantly changing around the hard bits of the city, the hard fabric, the buildings and the cultural institutions? So we've got our share of great events and exhibitions. There's the Bowie exhibition, a huge triumph at, uh, at uh, the V&A. We've got an incredible, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to tell you. There's an incredible exhibition coming at the Science Museum next year. Look out for it. I can't tell you what it is. They told me, but I'm sworn to secrecy. It's diplomatically sensitive. Let's put it that way, so you'll have to intrigue you. But we have the River Festival, my favorite festival. I don't know if any of you have ever been. Uh, that runs on the river in, in uh, early September, three-day festival up and down the banks of the river. Fantastic. Next year, we have a children's festival coming for the first time, uh, which will be a huge thing for us, alongside our film festival, which is growing in stature. Uh, we'll be up there along with Cannes and the rest of it uh, pretty soon. Obviously, fashion, design, the Lord Mayor's show this weekend. I hope if you're around for the weekend, you'll stay for it. Fantastic spectacle. And, of course, the Notting Hill Carnival. All of this is about animating the street, about animating street life and drawing people in, alongside some of the other things we do, like you know, VIP days where we close the streets of the West End for extra shopping in the run up to Christmas, all that kind of stuff. We need to make sure we've got space for people. And I have to say, if, if the market decides then the hotel developers and hotel operators are deciding that London is going to grow because we have something like 120,000 new hotel rooms coming on stream in the next 10 years. Everything from you know, the first Shangri-La in Europe going into the Shard, opening next year. Uh, Wanda, the Chinese operator, is building a huge tower at Nine Elms uh, with a big new hotel. Right down, I have to say, to the budget end, Travel Lodge, our own beloved Travel Lodge, have big plans. They're already the largest hotel here in London, but big plans to expand in the capital, and there are hotels opening up. Um, there's a new one opening up, I think, in Sea Containers House on the river. As I say, 120,000 rooms uh, coming, uh, which is a great, if you like, vote of confidence by those investors and operators in the way the city is going to go. And then, of course, food. When I came to London 25 years ago, food here was a joke. People would not think of London as a culinary capital. Now, you can't step across the street without tripping over Celebrity Chef. We have 8,000 uh, restaurants in the capital, some of the best restaurants in the world. There's so much good food in London that two out of three Londoners is about to become four out of five Londoners. Um, all we seem to be doing is consuming. Uh, very hard to get uh, tables in high-end restaurants at the moment. Um, so the, the cocktail is there, if you like. It's a very, very heady cocktail, and one which we hope, as we promote across the world, people will see more and more um, and come. Not just for business, and they come for business in huge numbers, and not just for science, and we hope they will come more and more for science in the years to come but just to come for the sheer fun of it. Um, this is one of the critical things that we have. It's not just about the, the things on their own, the culture, the hotels. Which, it's the, the heady cocktail mix that brings people from across the world to London, to a city that seems to be constantly changing, constantly innovating, that drew losers like me from the north uh, and made us fall in love with the city and hopefully will draw uh, many of your customers into the future. And the critical thing for us as well in all of that mission is that we don't just see London as a pole of attraction on its own. Uh, we very, very much want to work with the rest of the United Kingdom to build a strong tourism brand across the world that pulls people in. At the moment, we have a slightly bonkers system where the regions of, of the UK compete for the same tourist. Come to Northern Ireland, come to London, come to Wales. They're all fantastic places, but you should come to them all at the same time. Come to London for a few days. Go to Wales for a few days. Spend some time in Edinburgh. It's a wonderful, wonderful touring holiday. I was just in Vienna uh, for Monday and Tuesday at a life sciences conference. There was a senior civil servant took me on one side. The uh, meeting that we had scheduled said he wanted to talk about economic cooperation. He actually wanted to talk about his three-week road, three road trip to the Lake District, uh, where he toured uh, the UK so much and the breed of sheep that he'd brought in uh, the Lake District and taken back to his little farm outside Vienna. Um, as I say, I was more than happy to talk about that, much more than economic cooperation. But it, he was very appreciative of the fact that there is much more to the United Kingdom than just London. London is the great honeypot that attracts 80 odd percent of people in. Uh, what we need to do, as I say, is work with our other regions to spread that love, spread those visitors, spread the wealth, and, as I say, build a bigger pie, a bigger slice of a growing pie for the United Kingdom in the future. Because this industry contributes, as you said, Michaela, 100 billion uh, to the United Kingdom. It would be nice to think that we could double that over the next 10 or 15 years and provide many of the service jobs and the fantastic holidays 
uh, to our young people and to all of your customers. Thank you very much.